All righty. So I'm going to, we're kind of splitting this lecture or this day into two different chapters. I know we've talked a lot about tissues. The, the PowerPoint, this is the PowerPoint I posted on Canvas for, I think I called it histology abbreviated or something. This is just sort of a, um, a summary of some of the main points of that tissue chapter. And I said, I was gonna talk about glands and membranes, which we haven't done yet. And you didn't have to do for your outline. Some of you did, which is awesome. Uh, but I'll talk about the glands and membranes aspect, uh, which won't take long. And then just kind of a reminder of those four main tissue types to just sort of bring everything back together. Um, you still, what you need to know, you'll need to know this information, but you probably already know most of this. Uh, but you also want to know the info that's in those tables that I sent earlier this week, the 5.2 to 5.11 tables in your text. That's the information, that's where I'll pull questions from on some of the more specific tissue information like locations and functions for the exam. This is just sort of wrapping it up, kind of bringing it back together, reminding you of a few of the main points. And then that should take probably half the class and then the other half will get into chapter six, which is the integumentary system, the skin. Um, and don't forget your chapter six outline is due on Monday. Okay. I think that's it. Any questions before we get started here? All right. So yeah, this is just going to be kind of a heavy lecture day. <clears throat> All right. So first, histology. You guys know this information already, hopefully. Histology, when you hear that word, it just means we're studying tissues and it's kind of at the, not kind of, it is at the microscopic level. So we're looking at slides basically of a bunch of cells packed together, working together as a tissue system. The four broad categories of tissues, you wanna know these by heart. You have the epithelial, connective, muscle, and nervous tissue. So what I'm gonna do other than the glands and membranes is kind of, like I said, just give you some of the main points that you should associate with each of these tissue types. We're gonna be coming back to these epithelial, that's your skin basically. So the next chapter will be focusing on epithelial tissue in a little bit more detail as far as how the skin works. Connective tissue, we'll talk about bone tissue specifically in the bone tissue chapter. We'll talk about the nervous tissue towards the end of the semester. And then muscular, we'll talk about obviously when we talk about the muscular system. So all these will come back up. This is just sort of that overview of the different tissue types. So first, um, some of the basics of epithelial tissue that you definitely want to understand. And as a reminder, mostly uh, epithelial tissues are just these sheets of really closely packed cells. So they're all packed really close to each other. They're connected to each other to kind of create this barrier. And that's the goal of epithelial tissue typically. All of those cells are attached to this connective tissue underneath, which we call the basement membrane. Let me move you guys over here a little bit. So the basement membrane is at the base of these cells. At least the first layer of these cells is always attached to the basement membrane. There might be others stacked on top, but the first layer always attached to the basement membrane. Um, epithelial tissues typically cover the surface. So like I said, our skin is epithelial tissue. So outer surface, um, anything that kind of opens to the outside. So your nasal passage uh, inside your mouth, et cetera. Those are all lined by epithelial tissue, as well as your internal body cavities that aren't necessarily open or aren't open for the most part to the outside world. So your pericardial cavity, abdominal cavity, all of those cavities that we've learned are lined on the inside by epithelial tissue. A point I may or may not have brought up before, but an important one, especially we'll talk about this a lot more when we get into the next chapter, the skin chapter, um, epithelial tissue is avascular. So that means it doesn't have a direct blood supply. So the upper layers of your skin don't actually have blood vessels running through them. There are blood vessels and nerves underneath in the connective tissue, but epithelial tissue is avascular. The opposite would obviously be vascular. <laughs> the connective tissue below it is vascular. It has blood vessels. The epithelial tissue does not. 
All right, so those are some of the main bullet points that you want to know about epithelial tissues. Into some gland stuff. So what is a gland? Um, a gland is essentially uh, a cell or organ, so it can be really small or kind of bigger, just kind of varies, that's going to secrete a substance that is either used somewhere else in the body or it's excreted from the body. Most of these glands in our body are made of epithelial tissue. So for the most part, any gland that you think of is pretty much going to be epithelial tissue. Saliva glands obviously make saliva. They are creating and secreting saliva um, and they are epithelial tissue. Uh, sweat glands, we'll get into those when we talk about the integumentary system. Those are made of epithelial tissue. They're obviously secreting sweat along with some water with other stuff. Um, adrenal glands, we'll get into when we talk about the nervous system a little bit more, but these are little glands that sit right on top of your kidneys. They're really important in controlling some of the unconscious aspects of our nervous system. But all of those are kind of obviously very different salivary glands versus adrenal glands. They're still all just epithelial tissue. They just are releasing something, secreting something that's either used elsewhere in the body, like the adrenal glands, they're secreting hormones. Saliva is basically, I guess, kind of used elsewhere in the body because we swallow it, but also just excreted um, and not necessarily used in the body. So. It can be for elimination or use elsewhere in the body. The only other information I really wanna cover about glands right now is that there's these two main categories. So you have exocrine and endocrine glands. Glands are gonna fall into one or the other category. The, you may have heard endocrine. We've learned about the endocrine system a little bit. It's one of the 11 organ systems you need to know about. So endocrine glands are going to basically secrete hormones directly into the bloodstream. Endo means inside. So they are releasing their hormones inside the body. Exocrine are going to release something for the most part outside the body. So they're secreting a substance that is for the most part um, excreted or secreted onto the surface of the epithelial tissue. So sweat is a great example of an exocrine gland. It's secreting water and salt and potentially oils out onto the surface of the epithelium. So the surface of your skin. They do this by way of a duct. So there's always some kind of duct, which is just a little tube that takes from the gland area, um, takes whatever it's secreting out to the surface of the epithelial tissue. Exocrine glands have ducts, endocrine glands do not have ducts. So endocrine secreting hormones directly into the bloodstream. That would be the adrenal glands, for instance. So the adrenal glands are secreting hormones into the bloodstream. And those, I think I mentioned this before, hormones are just chemical messengers. So they're sending a message to somewhere else in the body or that part of the body to do something. Examples here would be yeah, the adrenal, thyroid, pituitary glands. You don't have to worry about what those do right now. Just kind of recognize that those are internal glands. You may or may not have heard those terms before, but they release hormones directly into the bloodstream. Our sweat, tear, salivary glands, all of those are releasing something to the surface of our body. All right, and that's all I'm gonna talk about with glands as we get into some of the other organ systems. We'll talk a little bit more about them mostly in the nervous system, but exocrine versus endocrine, make sure you know the difference there. Oh, and I will talk about, yeah, sweat glands a lot when we get into the integumentary system. Okay, so on to connective tissue, our second major category of the four. Um, this is the most diverse and the most abundant tissue type in the body. And the general description of it is just that the cells occupy a lot less space than the matrix around the cells. So you can think of it as a jello mold, like I put up there. So the cells would be those, I don't know who actually eats this or if anyone ever, ever did, but jello with olives in it. The olives would be like the cells. 
Um, and then there's a lot of this gelatinous rubbery substance around it. So that's actually a pretty decent analogy of what connective tissue sort of looks like if we think about it um, in a jello mold sense. The matrix is also called the ground substance. So you'll see that term used sometimes, but that's the jello. So the jello is the ground substance or the matrix, the whatever chunks of whatever you're putting in the jello mold are the cells. So the olives, the, I don't know if those are oranges, I don't know what's in there. Um, that would be the cells. So cells are just kind of suspended in this gelatinous matrix. That's very different from the epithelial tissue where the cells are packed right next to each other. There's a lot of functions of connective tissue. Um, supporting, connecting, and protecting are kind of the three big ones. So the connective tissue will kind of help support our organs in space. It'll connect them to some membranes. And then along with that, it kind of protects the organs. It can create some um, insulation as well as shock absorption. So the fatty tissue a lot of times is helpful for shock absorption. So if we, I don't know, fall over, um, we don't injure our organs, that fat kind of takes on some of that shock. I have mentioned fibers kind of on and off. There are a lot of fibers running through connective tissue. So there's the cells, the matrix, and the fibers. Those are kind of the three main parts of the connective tissue overall. Um, I'm not going to go into details about the different the differences between these three fibers. I want you to know their names. So no collagen, reticular, and elastic. Know those are three fiber types that are in connective tissue. And just know that they're all made of protein. So they're all protein heavy fibers that are basically running through the matrix. So these little purple things are the cells. There's a ton of fibers running in between them. So that kind of helps with that connection and support function of connective tissue as well. So here on Zoom, you guys can see all of these fibers running through here. I think that's all I have about connective tissue, is it? <clears throat> yes, oh well, bone tissue, okay. So I'm not gonna go into any other specifics other than the bone tissue on connective tissue. So remember bone is a connective tissue. It seems weird, it seems like it should be its own thing, but it's a connective tissue. So there's a few terms that you need to be familiar with with bone tissue. There's a whole chapter on bone tissue coming up. So you'll see this again, um, I don't, I don't know if it's before the next exam. I can't remember. I think it might be. Um, so you'll see this again. You'll get familiar with these terms, but I want to bring them up so you at least have been introduced to them. You've seen them already in lab um, and in your outlines, hopefully. Uh, but bone tissue is kind of a weird connective tissue because it's calcified. Calcified just means it has a lot of calcium in it and it's hard. Obviously our bones are hard. It's not like the soft, squishy, all of the other tissues I kind of think of as soft and squishy. Bone tissue is not. It is hard because it has a ton of calcium in it. The different parts of the bone tissue to be able to identify. So as I mentioned um, in lab, I kind of think of bone tissue as if you cut a tree um, and look down at the stump, that's kind of one part of the bone tissue. So one of these rings, an osteon, would be like one tree stump that you're looking down at. So an osteon is one of those kind of uh, these groups of concentric circles around what we call the central or haversian canal. So for you guys on Zoom, you can probably see it a little bit better on Zoom actually. It's not a great picture. Um, there's a bunch of concentric circles here. They're called lamellae just concentric circles of tissue around this canal, the central canal. That makes up one osteon where that concentric circle, where those concentric circles end and another one begins, those are separate os osteons. I don't know if that's plural, but osteons. The central canal is important because that's where the blood vessels and the nerves come into the bones. So your bones, your bone tissue, whether you know it or not has blood vessels running through it as well as nerves. So it's innervated and vascularized.
I haven't talked a lot about different kinds of cells. I will when we get into the integumentary system as well as the bone tissue chapter. Um, osteocytes are basically one type of cell that makes bone tissue and they're found in what we call these lacuna, which are the, basically these black dots here. So in all of these black dots that you see on the screen, those are housing, they're like little pockets for an individual cell. Those cells are making the bone tissue. So within each of those individual cells in the lacuna, they're creating bone tissue and secreting it out. Those are the main terms you need to know right now for bone tissue. There's a lot more coming up, obviously, in the, yes? When you get a bone bruise, what's one of these? Which one of these is yeah. affected? Yeah. A bone bruise would probably go to the central canal because that's where the blood vessel is. So the blood vessel is what's going to sort of rupture in order to create that bruise. Yeah, good question. I'm not 100% sure on that, but that would be my guess, but I'll, I'll look it up. I will find out. <clears throat> All right, um, nervous tissue. So this is the easy one to identify, right? Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about it now because we're going into it in plenty of detail towards the end of the semester. But the whole point of nervous tissue is to communicate between different areas of the body. So electrical signals and chemical signals are sent through nervous tissue in order to send messages from the brain out to other parts of the body or vice versa from kind of lateral parts of the body to the brain. The two main cell types here, well, the only two cell types really, are going to be the neuron and the neuroglia. So the neuron is that really crazy shaped cell that has these arms and branches coming off of it. That's where signals are received or sent. We'll talk about that when we get into the nervous tissue chapter. Um, but those branches are basically where the chemicals and electrical signals are sent out or brought in to the neuron. The neuron's the main cell. It's doing most of the work, but all these other little cells around it are called the neuroglia or the glial cells. Those two terms are used, I would say 50-50, so totally interchangeably. They're pretty similar, but you can call them either neuroglia, glial cells. They're all these little tiny dots that are surrounding the neuron, and they're kind of supporting and nourishing the neuron. So the neuron needs a lot of help, and that's what the neuroglia are essentially doing. They're kind of helping out. And there's a ton of them compared to the number of neurons. So there you see one neuron and probably 20, 20 different glial cells. <clears throat> so they're small and just little helper cells, basically. All right, for now, that's nervous tissue. Just as a reminder, kind of bringing it back together, what nervous tissue is all about. Muscle tissue, um, so this is just a tissue type that can contract in order to create movements. That's the whole purpose of muscle tissue. Uh, it also uses electrical signals to make that happen, and we'll talk about how that works. But the cells, the tissues are basically contracting to create some kind of movement. The most obvious movement is us moving, you know, our body parts, our limbs, the conscious kind of skeletal muscle movements. The unconscious ones are probably arguably a little bit more important for survival. So there's muscles that um, allow us to breathe. Those are unconscious. Obviously you're doing that while you're sleeping. Uh, blood circulation, digestion, all of those body functions, which keep us alive, are essentially due to this muscle contraction that we really never think about. So there's a lot of muscle contractions happening that aren't just you know us flexing our arm. Something I haven't talked about really is that muscle tissue provides a lot of body heat. I don't think I mentioned that yet, but it's really important in our thermoregulation. So without um, enough muscle tissue, the body heat kind of balance can go out of whack. 
So muscular tissue is really important in creating heat because the movement basically allows for heat generation. Okay, that sums up the that sums up the summary of the tissues basically. All I have left for this lecture, um, for this part of this class, basically this PowerPoint lecture is the membranes. Um, so I just want to briefly tell you what a membrane is, and then I'm going to tell you about the three membranes you want to be familiar with, three of the most important membranes in the body. So what is a membrane? Um, you probably have a general idea of what a membrane is. You've heard about the cell membrane. It's just kind of that outer layer. In this case, it's a kind of the same idea. It's just a thin sheet of cells. It's basically lining something. It can be lining the exterior part of our body. It could be lining an interior cavity, but it's a thin sheet of cells that are lining something in our body. The cutaneous membrane we're going to talk about in detail. That's just the skin. So the whole next chapter, we're going to be talking about the cutaneous membrane. It's the largest membrane in the body. It's also considered an organ. So it's the largest organ in the body. Um, what is it made of? Basically, it's epithelium and connective tissue. So you have stratified squamous epithelium, which you know is your skin. So you have many layers of those flattened out epithelial cells. That's what we call the epidermis. I'll get into this again in the next chapter. That's sitting on top of connective tissue, basically, which is called the dermis. And for now, that's really all you need to know. The cutaneous membrane has these two layers. It's epithelial as well as connective tissue, and it's the largest membrane in the body. Anytime you see the word cutaneous, that's going to refer to something with the skin. OK. That's membrane number one. Membrane number two is the lovely mucous membrane. And those are kind of throughout our body. So mucous membranes are found essentially wherever there's kind of an opening to the outside world. They provide this layer of mucus, which is a nice protective layer, basically. It helps reduce water loss, um, fight off anything that's trying to invade our bodies. Not necessarily lovely to think about, but without it, uh, we'd have a lot more microbes invading our body and we'd be much more dehydrated. Um, so this is going to line passages that open to the external environment. The digestive tract, nasal passages, those are kind of the two of the most obvious ones. This membrane is made up of three different types of tissues. So it's epithelial, connective, and muscular. So the cutaneous membrane was just epithelial and connective. This is all three of those. Nervous tissue isn't really ever involved in membranes. So we have the three um, possible tissues being involved here. It obviously secretes mucus. So the mucous membrane is making and secreting mucus. It's also absorbing things. So different nutrients, gases, et cetera. And like I said, it, its main function is to protect. So it's creating this viscous layer that doesn't allow things to penetrate into the epithelial tissue. Another cell type, this is actually a really easy one to remember because it's very aptly named. It's the goblet cell. So um, goblet cells are kind of these wine glass shaped cells and that's where the mucus is produced. So when you look at a goblet cell, kind of narrow at the bottom then opens up. This is where all that lovely mucus is being made in that cell and then secreted out onto that surface or that passage that eventually opens to the outside world. So goblet cells you'll see in like pseudo stratified epithelium. Um, you'll see those a lot. You probably saw them in some of the slides I showed you before. They're really common in anything like columnar or like pseudo stratified columnar as well. They're very common. So when you see that wine glass shape, that's a goblet cell, very distinctive. And it's making mucus. All right, and the last membrane, one we don't really think about, I mean, maybe you don't think about any of those others either, but the serous membrane is one we don't really 
ever experience from a conscious point of view. We experience the other two plenty. Um, the serous membrane is one that's lining all of the internal cavities of our body and our organs. So it's covering our organs, it's lining um, the abdominal cavity, the pelvic cavity, the pleural, pericardial, cranial, all those internal cavities that you've learned, they're all lined by this actually really simple kind of thin membrane called the serous membrane. It has the three types of tissues as well. It has epithelial, connective, and muscular tissue involved in it. So one thin layer of squamous epithelial cells, so simple squamous, just one layer. Then you have this areolar connective tissue and then um, smooth muscle under that. A large, um, one of the big functions of the serous membrane is to produce what is called serous fluid appropriately. And that just allows for lubrication, which you might be thinking, why do we need lubrication on our internal organs? So our organs are fairly tightly packed in there. If you've ever, when we were looking at those organ systems in lab, they're packed really tightly together. And sometimes they'll move a little bit, obviously, as you move. So the organs will move kind of microscopically. And that fluid basically just allows for less friction between your organs. As you might imagine, friction between your organs can get a bit uncomfortable and cause some injuries and abrasions. So this serous fluid is just kind of like an oil kind of in between lubricating um, the areas between the organs. So really important function of the serous membrane is lubrication. And that's it. That's all the membranes and the gland stuff and then the kind of review of the big picture of those four connective tissue types. So hopefully that was helpful, not too repetitive. Um, and now we're going to just go ahead and move right into um, the integumentary system. So let me get that pulled up. All right. All right. Kind of, I don't know, I guess it flows nicely considering we were just talking about the cutaneous membrane. We're going to go into detail on the cutaneous membrane. Essentially, that's the integumentary system. So integumentary, um, I'll define it in just a second, but it's the skin. We're talking about the skin. So I would say this is probably the most familiar organ to everybody. It's not like we have a lot of experience dealing with our heart or our stomach or our liver. I mean, we know they do things for us, but we don't really see them. So we don't really think about them. Um, the skin is probably the most familiar, but potentially one of the least appreciated organs. We often don't even, I mean, I don't know when I learned it was an organ, probably when I was in college. <laughs> I didn't know it was an organ until I was in college. So it's underappreciated, um, I think, in a lot of ways. And it's interesting in that it's the only organ that you can really, that defines some of your identity, right? It gives you some identity. Your heart doesn't necessarily give you identity for your brain or your kidneys. Um, no outward identity is bestowed by those organs, but the skin, massive amounts of identity. So it kind of has a psychological factor as well as a really important obviously physical uh, contributions to your body functioning. So it gives us information about our ancestry, kind of where we came from, um, our age, our past. So if you've had surgery and have scars or you have tattoos or something like that, it tells you a lot about your past, um, just you as a person, which is kind of cool. No other organ really does that. So it's an interesting and sadly, I guess, underappreciated organ in a lot of ways. The main point of the skin is really to provide protection against the elements. So it's sort of, you can think of it as like body armor. It's our body armor for our internal, more important, not more important, but really critically important organ systems. 
There is a ton of money that goes into um, research about the skin and from mostly a cosmetic point of view uh, from the kind of beauty industry. So there's a lot of focus on the skin from that perspective. Um, so again, it's probably pretty familiar to you. The definition of the integumentary system is not just the skin. So the integumentary system as a whole, this is our organ system. So the skin's an organ. The integumentary system is a combination of the skin, hair, nails, and glands. So the integumentary organ system is more than just the skin. It's these other aspects that we don't necessarily think of, but our hair and nails are part of an organ system, the integumentary system. Most people know the term dermatology. It's just that's the medical part, the medical um, aspect of studying the skin, the integumentary system overall. So dermatologists are the ones that are focused in on the integumentary system in particular. So I already mentioned this, but the skin is our largest organ. Um, it's a bunch of, it's different tissue types working together. That's why we consider it an organ, if you remember the definition. So tissues are a bunch of cells working together. An organ is gonna be multiple tissues working together. So our skin is the largest and heaviest organ. You probably don't think about how much your skin weighs, uh, but it's about 16% of your body weight. That obviously varies among people, but on average, it's about 16% of your total body weight. And this is kind of creepy to think about, but if you spread out skin <laughs> um, on a, in a two-dimensional um, way, it can cover up to two meters squared. And that is hard to kind of imagine, but that's about the size of a full-size bed. So if you laid out someone's skin, creepy, on the bed or on a surface, it would be about the size of a full-size bed. So that's a lot of surface area. I can't think of any other organ that would even come close to that. So it's big, it's heavy, and it does a lot for us. It's obviously really vulnerable to outside forces. Um, like I said, it's kind of our body armor. And for that reason, because it's kind of constantly getting bombarded with a number of different things, radiation, um, cuts, other trauma, infection, um, chemicals, it ends up being treated more frequently. Um, from a medical perspective than any other organ. So it gets a lot more attention from a medical perspective, not necessarily in a good way, but more because it has to put up with so much, so many different materials, et cetera, bombarding it all the time. So you really wanna focus on having healthy skin. And what I mean by healthy skin is just not like dry, cracked, rash prone, um, infected kind of skin. So healthy, normal skin creates this nice barrier. Any kind of disrupted skin where you have, um, gosh, a number of different types of um, uh, infections or rashes, et cetera, can basically allow little inroads for microbes, viruses, et cetera, to get in. So creating this healthy outer layer, the epidermis, is going to be a lot better for the internal parts as well. All right. There are uh, three different layers that I'm going to talk about dealing with the skin. Um, this bottom one, which I'll talk about in a minute, is not technically part of the skin. It's sort of the underlying layer, but it's always talked about with the skin. I don't know why there's that distinction, but um, the integumentary system, the cutaneous membrane is the epidermis and dermis. So these are the two parts of the skin. The hypodermis we're gonna talk about, but it's technically not part of the skin. Um, yeah, it's confusing, but that's just how we're doing it. <laughs> so the epidermis is gonna be, well, epi means on top of, right? Dermis means, well, on top of the dermis. So the dermal layer, you have the epidermis on top of it, you have the hypodermis underneath it. Hypo means low or below. So the dermis is the main thick layer right here. And then you have the epidermis on top, the hypodermis 
which is mostly just fatty tissue on the bottom. Okay, so I already mentioned this um, in the last chapter, but the epidermis is avascular. So there's no blood vessels running into your epidermis. So if you get a cut and you start bleeding, you've cut down to the dermis because it's vascular. So you've gotten down to that second layer, basically, if you get a cut. If you've ever had a paper cut where you're not bleeding, um, you likely only cut into the epidermis or any other kind of cut, I guess. But I always get paper cuts that don't end up bleeding. <laughs> so I think of those first. That only, um, that would be only to the epidermis. If you're bleeding, you're getting into the dermis. The epidermis is these closely packed epithelial cells. So beyond the epidermis, that's the epithelial cells. Below that, it's all connective tissue. The dermis is a combination of a couple of different types of connective tissue. So it's loose areolar, kind of near the top. And then it's dense irregular um, as you get a little bit deeper. And I didn't talk about dense irregular in lab. I think we just covered dense regular, which is that wavy stuff. So you saw dense irregular in those tables um, that you're supposed to base your outline off of. The benefit of dense irregular is that it's not in those nice layers. It's just kind of randomly assorted. And that means it can absorb stress from a lot of different directions. So it absorbs stress from a lot of different directions. You can pull your skin up, you can push it down, you can move it to the side. And that um, lower dermal layer is basically going to resist all of that stress from all those different directions. So that's the dense irregular connective tissue benefit. Down into the hypodermis, again, not technically part of the skin formally. It's that connective tissue, mostly fatty tissue, which you can kind of see here are these little globules of fat underneath the dermis. It is also highly vascularized. As you might imagine, I'm gonna go into more detail about each of these layers. Uh, but I think first I have information on the functions of the skin. So we'll get probably into these layers on Monday, but that's kind of the overview of that stratification within the, uh, the skin. Okay, so thin skin versus thick skin. This was, I don't know if we got to this question in here on the, um, on the histology jeopardy. I don't think so. But we have both thin skin and thick skin. Those are aptly named because the thick skin has one extra layer compared to the thin skin. Thin skin is essentially everywhere on your body other than the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. Thick skin is only on the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet. Thin skin has four layers. We'll learn what those are. Thick skin has five. And you'll learn the names of all of those. The epidermis of thin skin is about a tenth of a millimeter thick versus half a millimeter thick for thick skin. So, you know, it's kind of hard to picture that difference, but that's the technical average between the two. The main differences that you can see are that thin skin has sweat glands, it has hair, it has um, sebaceous or oil glands. Thick skin of those three, it only has sweat glands. So obviously the palms of your hands and the soles of your feet can sweat. So those glands are present, but you don't have hair on the palm of your hand. That would be weird. And you also don't have any oil glands. So no sebaceous glands. So those are the main differences between the thin skin and the thick skin. Now into the functions. So I've already talked about uh, this barrier function. So that's what I'm gonna focus on here in a couple different ways. So the skin can resist trauma and infection. By trauma, I mostly mean lacerations or cuts um, up to a certain extent, obviously, you still get cut. Um, that's due mostly to a protein called keratin. 
So keratin is a really tough protein. I mentioned it in here a little while back when we were going over um, some of the chemistry stuff. Keratin is useful in kind of preventing that infection and trauma. And interestingly, your skin, your sweat glands basically release a natural antibiotic as well. So they're releasing something called dermocidins. Those are going to sort of prevent overcolonization by microbes. So you have microbes and bacteria living all over your body. Too much of them is not good. So your sweat glands are essentially releasing this natural antibiotic to keep them from sort of taking over too much. Other barriers or other things that um, the skin protects against and keeps out or in is water. So you don't want too much water in or you don't wanna to lose too much water. So the keratin is also beneficial for that. Keratin helps keep water in or too much excess water out. Along with glycolipids, you don't really need to know exactly what glycolipids are, but they're lipids with a little carbohydrate chain attached. They're gonna help reduce water loss as well. UV radiation, basically anytime you step outside, you're exposing your skin to UV radiation from the sun. So if your deeper layers were exposed to UV radiation, it would cause some major problems. They're not really dealt, they're not really built to handle that or deal with the UV radiation. So your epidermis is really good at kind of stopping the UV radiation before it gets into the deeper layers where it would cause some major issues. And then, as I mentioned, harmful chemicals. So, you know, bleach or gosh, rubbing alcohol, all of that, you don't want getting into your insides. So your skin is just a barrier to any of those harmful chemicals that you deal with on a daily basis. So you might not even think of as harmful. You may not know this, but your skin is really important for actually producing vitamin D as well. Does anyone know what vitamin D is good for? Kind of. It makes something strong. What do you want to be strong in your body? Everything, but bones, yeah. So your bones and teeth. Vitamin D is critical to add strength to your bones and teeth. We naturally have kind of the precursor molecule to vitamin D, but we need sunlight for our skin to actually start the process of making the vitamin D. So we can make our own vitamin D, but we have to have sunlight. Um, so the first step is really that the skin is absorbing UV light, starting to transform that precursor to vitamin D, and then it continues on in the liver and kidneys. So that'll kind of complete the process of actually making the vitamin D. Um, so without sunlight, if you're not getting enough sun, you might be vitamin D deficient. Um, I think 30 minutes a day is all that's required. So if you're outside kind of when, you know, midday for about 30 minutes, you'll be producing plenty of vitamin D. You don't need to take a supplement. Um, if you have a tough time getting out for that long, which I, I don't know if I really do most days, you might be sort of deficient in vitamin D. There's supplements, um, there's vitamin D milk. So little kids drink whole milk, which is basically um, has a ton of vitamin D in it to help their bones and their teeth grow strong. Um, and there's, I don't know if any of you guys listen to Radio Lab. It's an interesting podcast, kind of sciencey podcast. But they, last year I heard this episode about the relationship between how much vitamin D someone produces and their reaction to getting COVID-19. So they found, or there's evidence, they're still studying it. I haven't updated it. I haven't looked into the updates since last year, probably in August, I think is when I heard this. Um, but vitamin D seems to help decrease the severity of the symptoms of COVID-19, which is pretty interesting. So if people have heightened levels of vitamin D, they don't react to COVID-19 as heavily. Um, and that's what this episode of Radiolab was about. It's all, most of the information is in the first 20 minutes. So I'm gonna let you guys listen to that on your own. The link is here. Um, but it has to do with uh, homeless populations who they were obviously very worried about when COVID-19 kind of hit the stage. 
but homeless people typically get a lot of sunlight, which means they're making a lot of vitamin D and they saw generally fewer symptoms, fewer severe cases in the homeless population of COVID-19. And they're trying to kind of figure out if that's the link. So it's actually pretty fascinating. It's only 20 minutes. So take a listen to that um, whenever you get a chance. And then obviously function, from a functional perspective, um, the skin is really important in sensing different things. So it senses touch, pain, um, temperature changes. It's sensing all kinds of different things on a basically second by second basis. So it's a huge sensory organ. And then the last one, this kind of relates to the sense, sensory organ aspect or sensory reception aspect of skin, um, thermoregulation. Thermoregulation is one of the main functions of skin. Um, it has thermoreceptors in it, so it can tell if you're hot or cold. And then it can react based on whether you're too hot or too cold or kind of in the happy, happy area in between. So a couple of different things can happen in order to regulate your temperature. Vasodilation and vasoconstriction are two of the main ones, along with perspiration. I think everyone knows when you sweat, you're releasing heat because you're releasing that water, which holds on to a lot of heat. So perspiration is a big way that the skin can kind of bring the body temperature back down. Vasodilation, when you see that term, it means that your blood vessels are dilating or becoming larger in diameter. That is increasing the surface area, which means more heat can be released. Vasoconstriction is the opposite. So your um, blood vessels are gonna constrict, kind of shrink down, and that will keep, as, keep heat from being lost. Another kind of cool aspect of this is whether you're in a cold climate versus a hot climate, your blood flow will actually change. So some blood vessels will no longer get blood if your body needs to hold on to heat. So we'll look at the hot version here first. So this guy's running in the woods and his blood is flowing all the way up to here, kind of near the surface of his body and heat is being lost, right? So there's a lot of heat in his blood. It's being lost through the surface and then flowing back down. In the cold climate, this whole area basically doesn't get any blood flow, at least temporarily. Obviously, if that continues, it can cause um, a lot of different issues. So the blood is only flowing in these lower capillaries in order to hold on to that heat. So it's not releasing heat to the outside world if it's keeping the blood kind of further down in the skin. So you actually get this change in overall blood flow through your blood vessels in order to thermoregulate. Okay, and that's all the time we have. It's good. It's a good stopping point. Um, so we'll pick up with that on Monday. Thank <laughs> you.